My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, this is Lexi Gunther. Today's leadership quote is from Bernie Brown. Leadership isn't about having all the right answers. It's about having all the right questions. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. With so much on your plate, wouldn't it be nice if ordering food for the office were easy and reliable? My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. With Easy Cater's network of over 100,000 restaurants nationwide, you'll have a huge variety of options near you for any group size, dietary need, or budget. Your food arrives on time as ordered, all supported 24-7 by Easy Cater's team of experts. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hey friends, thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. Welcome to episode 210. That's right, 210. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 210, leaderassistant.com slash 210. And today I am speaking with Lexi Gunther. Lexi is in Illinois. Is that right, Lexi? Yep, that's right. And what part of Illinois? So I'm about an hour west of Chicago. Nice. And are you from that area? I am. I grew up a little bit closer to Chicago in the western suburbs. Um, And then just about, well, this summer, actually, we moved away out to the cornfields. So a little bit further (laughs) away now, but it's nice and quiet. Awesome. Do you have chickens or cows or anything like that yet? Nothing exciting like that yet. Just a family to wrangle. (laughs) Awesome. Tell us a little bit about your family, Uh, kids, dogs. Yeah. So my husband and I have been married for almost 11 years um, and we have three kids. We have a 17-year-old daughter, um, a five-year-old son, and then our littlest is eight months old, an eight-month-old daughter. Quite the spread. That is a spread. (laughs) And then we have one dog who's four years old and a cat who's six months old. So we're, you know, in the thick of it with all the things. <laughs> wow. That's great. Well, what what is your favorite, your family's favorite thing to do? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, my personal favorite thing to do is yoga, but that's my own quiet time where I get away from all the craziness of mm-hmm. the family. Um, but you know, in the, in the fall out here, we love to go to like the pumpkin festivals and, um, you know, there's a lot of like hay rides and, um, just fun things to do in the fall when the weather is comfortable for the, you know, couple months that we have nice weather. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The Midwest is beautiful in the fall. So it's a good, good time for Midwest. Yeah, I tell everybody the winter really lasts for like six months here. And then we get, you know, a month of spring, a couple of months of summer, a month of fall, and then we're back to the winter. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on the show. Let's talk a little bit about your professional journey. Uh, yeah. How did you end up being an assistant and kind of tell us a little bit about your your history? Yeah. So um, my path is a little bit different than others. Um, When I was 16, I actually dropped out of high school and um, right away started working a full-time job as like one of my friend's parents owned a business. And so I was doing some data entry for them. Um, A few years later, when I was 20, I found myself pregnant and single and living with my mom in a small two bedroom apartment, um, which was not ideal. And um, at that time was doing a small like part time receptionist thing at a country club. Um, 
the country clubs here close in January because of winter and can't do much fun stuff. So um, I actually took that opportunity. My daughter was born in January. So I took that opportunity to just be home with her and kind of figure out what the heck I'm doing with my life. Um, so when she was a year old, I was like, you know what? I need to find something. And I was, this, this will age me, but I was going through the paper and I found an ad in the paper, <laughs> um, for a receptionist position. And I called, um, went in for an interview. Um, and it was at a nonprofit organization. And so I interviewed with the manager and she hired me on the spot and she said, you know, you have a lot of potential and, I am going to hire you, but you need to go get your GED within the next, you know, 60 days or something. Wow. So that was really cool because I, you know, I kept saying like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then you never do it if you don't have that push, you know? So, um, I went and got my GED and she came back to me afterwards and said, I wouldn't have fired you if you didn't get it. I just knew you wouldn't go get it if I didn't give you that push. Oh, wow. (laughs) So got that done. Um, and then, you know, within a year was promoted to um, administrative assistant. And then, um, I mean, at this point I was making, I think like $12 an hour. And it's so crazy to think back to, you know, your very first jobs and how much you make. And um, somehow on that, I was able to get a one bedroom apartment for me and my daughter. Um And then I got a kind of got to a point where I didn't feel like there was much more to do. It was a really small nonprofit um, and loved the company and loved their mission, but I needed something more. And so um, now switched to Craigslist, also aging me, (laughs) found my next job there, administrative assistant to the president of an IT recruiting company. Um, And I grew so much in this role within... um, Two years, I was promoted to be his executive assistant and right hand, but I grew so I mean, he gave me, he never said no to me. So whether it was, you know, making coffee or ordering office supplies or designing our logo and building our website and writing blogs and going to client meetings. Um, during the time I worked there, he had two kids and I ran the office both times he was out for a week or he would go hunting for a week and I would run the office when he was out. And um you know, to step into the shoes of the president was just really, really a really good growth experience for me. Mm. Um, From there, I kind of took another, there were a couple jobs that, you know, I was there for five years and um, it was leaning more towards the recruiting side, which I wasn't, you know, I'm good at it, but I don't love it. And so took another two other EA jobs um, in finance and consulting Um, and during that time, my husband and I suffered some, um, infertility issues and we had three miscarriages during this time, which was just really an awful time in our life. Um, and so when I got pregnant with my son, who is now here with us, thankfully, I again, quit working. I was like, I just, you know, this is my baby. Like I need to soak all of this in. Um, and so I took time just to be home with the family when he was about eight months old, I went to um, start interviewing again and I landed at the world's largest environmental services company. And I was EA there to a few people. And that quickly morphed into basically chief of staff to the COO of North America. And again, you know, another role where I just got so much experience, which we can get into later. Um, And now I'm at Cedar and Cedar is um, an amazing company. They're a digital health company that's working to improve the financial experiences of patients. Um, It really has a lot of meaning to work there. Their mission is just unbelievable. And I've been in that situation, um, you know, where I think we all have, right? (laughs) That that the billing issues we get with Mm. medical companies. So I was really drawn towards this company and, and to work here. And now I've worked my way up to manage a team of six. I have six direct reports and um, I'm transitioning from being an EA to being a manager. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I feel like I just talked forever. No, you're good. You're good. (laughs) Love it. Sounds like a very, uh, interesting career history and some worked at some large companies and now you're at a smaller company, but, um, was the last company, as you said, environmental services. Yeah. Environmental services. Um, so Veolia was the company that I worked for and, um, they're, they're really big in France. If you go to France, you see their logos all over. Okay. 
but out here it's, you know, water, wastewater plants, energy plants, things like that. Um, and it was huge, you know, international company. Um, and I worked there during COVID too, which was really interesting because they were, um, they, they, we didn't close. We were a boots on the ground company. Obviously we had to keep water flowing. Um, so that was like when I took a really big leap in my career to take on a ton of projects and really help keep the company going, which was awesome. How did you manage, or do you have tips on managing international teams with different time zones and even languages and stuff? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, there was, um, I was working with people in China. I was working with people in France at another company. I was working with people in New Zealand and Australia. Um, You know, I think it's really a matter of getting down your calendar Tetris skills, right? And like Mm -hmm. having up the timeanddate.com or whichever website you use for that um, and plugging in all the different possibilities. You know, there are places in India where there's a half hour difference and like just remembering what those things are. Um, I used to keep a printout at my desk of the main places that we booked meetings between and, um, you know, just always trying to be on top of that because it's easy to schedule something and you're like, oh, wait, that's 3 a.m. in China. (laughs) I don't think that's going to work. Right. Um, And then, you know, there have been times, too, where I would like Google Translate, you know, someone sent me an email in, in French. And even though I took French in high school, I don't remember much of it at all. Um. And so I would like Google Translate and figure out mostly what it meant. Or my boss would be like, hey, I need to know what this contract says. And the contract is all in Fran- French. Um, but instead of being like, I don't read French, I would just figure it out, you know, drop it into Google Translate or talk to someone I know and um, get the information needed. So it's fun to navigate those things. Yeah, that's great. It's nice to have the technology too to uh, yes. add fingertips <laughs> to translate those kinds of things. <laughs> Absolutely. So was that during COVID then, was that, I'm assuming it was an in-office environment and then are are you currently in office, hybrid, remote? Yeah. So when I was at Veolia, we, COVID hit and we, um, the people that were in the office went home right away and we worked from home. And so it was like all of a sudden transforming my, you know, dining room into this digital world. I had these two monitors and, um, you know, a whole setup and I'm in calls from 7am to 7pm and just trying to figure all the things out. Um, I ended up going back to the office eventually because the way that we looked at it was kind of, you know, we have people in plants across the country that we expect to be there. And as office support, we should be supporting them by showing up as well. Um, So we ended up going back. My company now, Cedar, we have an option to be remote, to be hybrid, hybrid or to be in office. Um, And I'm 100% remote. Our headquarters are in New York. So I'll go in, you know, a couple of times a year, but I'm in my own office at my own home every day. Nice. Love it. I'm, I'm team remote. So as well. So that's great. I never thought, yeah, you never thought that, you know, I I think five, 10 years back and it's like, if I wasn't at work by 8am and, you know, leaving at 501 or later, like it was frowned upon and now, you know, running my own team, it's nice to be able to give them flexibility too. And, kind of work the hours they want to work. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the, the uh, maybe some of the challenges that you've had with the team kind of working your way up from being an EA and being an assistant on the team to leading the team. Is it, has there been any challenges? Is it like, Oh, I'm not your peer anymore. I'm, I'm your boss, but I was, I'm not going to be a, bad boss kind of a thing. (laughs) Yes. There's definitely like some things that I didn't think about when I was like, oh yeah, I'll totally take that job. Um, One of which, yeah, you know, we're, we're a young team. And so we've all been with the company for around a year, um, maybe a little bit more than that. And the team is phenomenal. And um, I had some really good relationship built, which I still do, but there was this transition of like, okay, I'm not your peer now. I am your manager. So when it comes to, you know, taking time off or um, you're working on a project and you don't have the bandwidth to do it, like anything that you would normally talk to your CEO about, now you have to talk to me about. And so kind of helping with that transition. Um, I've had an amazing career coach over the last few months who's helped with that as well. And um, 
also kind of learning to take a step back from the day-to-day tactical. Like in the beginning, I took over the team and I was kind of like, what are you guys working on? And how are you sending that invite? And what's the details you have in there? You know, all these things that like, well, this is the way I would do it. And I kind of sat with that for a little bit. And I was like, you know what? They are capable AAs and EAs. They're amazing at what they do. So I'm sitting back. I'm going to watch what they do. Um, You know, if they need help, I'm here. But really, um, and especially like our AAs, you know, they're trying to get up that ladder. They're trying to move into EA land. And so they have to make mistakes. You can't move forward if you don't make mistakes. Um, So I kind of want to be there now to, you know, let them make the mistake, catch them when they fall, show them how to do it better and kind of coach them along their way. So it's been a fun coaching experience. Yeah. So you basically started off leaning a little bit on the micromanager side of things. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, and I, and I dislike micromanagers very much. So I was like, oh, I'm not a micromanager. And then when I sat back, I was like, you know what, maybe there's a little bit of micromanagement in here. And I think it's that side of like, you know, being an EA, you really demand perfection. And so, you know, thinking of myself as an EA, which I do still support one of our, our head of product I support as well. Um, So I still have that EA side a little bit and, you know, we are so careful about, we don't let things fall through the cracks or, you know, I like to tell my team, like, if you make a mistake, it's okay. As long as you catch up before they do. So, you know, giving yourself a little bit of grace. It's a good um, motto. Yeah. And, um, you know, but it, it's hard to kind of step back from that, that perfectionism and say, you know what, it may not be the way that I do it, but it's the way that they do it. And it's perfect for them. And that's all that matters as long as their execs are happy. Mm. Nice. And so how long have you been at Cedar? So I have been there since October of 2021. So a little bit over a year. Okay. And have they grown quite a bit over the last year? (laughs) They did grow a little bit. um, And that, you know, now we're more in like a strategic place of, you know, how do we continue to build the company, build our products, get more clients, um, that side of it. So Yeah, I just asked, I'm curious and interested because I, you know, I work for a software company as well, uh, different, it's a help desk support automation software. Um, and you know, it's software is, is very different world than I was in the nonprofit world before this. Um, you were in environmental services, which I'm I'm assuming was very different than than the software vibe. Um, (laughs) So what's what's maybe a couple of tips um, for those listening who they're in a maybe a more traditional, quote unquote, old school industry, and they are excited about the possibility of working in a software company at some point. And I know um, from my experience and the research that we've done in our community, like generally software companies pay better, uh, pay assistance better, especially. Um so yeah, what any any advice on translating your skills from the old world to the new world? It's funny that you say that because I talk to my team a lot about like the old school company because you know Veolia has been around for you know a hundred years or however long it has been. Yeah. So to come to Cedar, that's a startup. Um, I even like the lingo was different, you know, like the way that they talked with all these acronyms and like tech talk. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what, I don't know what you're talking about. And I feel like I'm a hundred years old right now. (laughs) Um, but you know, to your point on the pay, pay is amazing in these companies. And, um, being a manager, I feel really great about that because I can pay my team really well. And I know that they deserve it. You know, EAs deserve to make a million dollars a year if they could, (laughs) they could because of we do. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it's the cool thing that I found. So when I was working at Veolia, I helped with a lot of processes. So I was kind of more on the chief of staff side where it's, you know, I'm digging in, I'm figuring out what isn't working. Um, how are things being done differently? I helped, you know, there were four different regions that we had across the United States and every region is doing something different, whether it's, you know, contribution request process or the risk memo process or different things. And so um, I built those processes. And so coming into a startup in the tech world, 
it's really kind of all over the place. There aren't a lot of processes. There aren't a lot of things in place just because they haven't built them yet. So someone who's worked at more of an old school company probably can bring a lot of that to a startup or to a software company of, you know, putting together these diagrams, these, you know, I talked to my team a lot about like swim lane, swim lane diagrams where you can build out, you know, who does what and um, making things very visual. I think having a lot of visuals is really helpful in this industry. And so having those skills, um, plus, you know, we were using like PowerPoint and Excel and Word and all those things. And now it's Google Sheets and Google Drive. And right. uh, I think, you know, people just need to not be afraid to make that jump into like the Google world. Or, you know, when I started at Cedar, I had never used Slack before. And now I can't imagine my life without Slack or Zoom. You know, like, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have Slack on my phone. Um, and so it's just embracing like, you know what, I know what I'm doing. I can take this over to another company and make the team or the company even better with the skills that I have that have kind of, you know, from this old school world, bring them over. I think the nice thing too, is, you know, those companies, you hear a lot of like, well, it's always been done this way. So we're always going to do it this way. And one thing about startups, especially at Cedar is like, well, I know this is the way we've done it in the past, but here's the way I think we should do it. And they really take that to heart and like dig in and think, wow, maybe that is a better idea. Yeah. They're open to ideas and innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love the software world. I love working in tech. Um, but I would say, and I'm curious what your experience is, when we talk about balance and and burnout and, you know, juggling work life schedules and working too much and all that fun stuff, you know, in the software world, um, there's kind of a an expectation that I've I've seen and experienced where it's like, oh, no, you're not working 40 hours a week. You know, it's like it, you're, we're getting this stuff done. And if it takes you 50 hours this week and 60 hours next week and 45 hours the next week, just is how it is. Whereas in some of the older, um, if you will, industries, and I'm thinking about even like finance, it's like, okay, you're you're there from eight to five or whatever, and then you clock out and you you're offline. So what was your experience? Was it was it similar? Whereas it was like more rigid, like all right, it's eight to five, eight to six, whatever, but then it's off. And now is it kind of any time, anywhere, or how's it been for you? Yeah. So my first several jobs were very eight to five. You know, I remember my um, the job at the the IT recruiting company and my boss finally had to sit me down and be like, you show up at 8.05 every day. Like we start at 8 a.m., you know, and it took like that moment to be like, oh, right, I should probably get here on time. Like it's my job. Um, and so since then, actually, now I'm never late to anything or I start to panic, but <laughs> it was a good life lesson. Um, at Veolia, it was, you know, it wasn't as strict. It was like, you know, show up between 8 and 8.30, but then you're leaving between 5 and 5.30. When we went to COVID, um, you know, I, I was working, taking calls at 7 a.m., seven days a week. And I was supporting people on the West Coast and the East Coast. And my team was kind of spread across the entire United States. Um, so it was busy and it was busy all day long. Um, coming into Cedar now, we are so, we support work-life balance so much. And that's something that I can't stress enough. That's so important to our mental health, which I'm a huge advocate for. Um, and you know, I tell my team all the time, I will never ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So if we do have a project that we need to work on, um, you know, I'm right there in the trenches with them and I always will be. And I think that's really important. And that's kind of the cool thing about having an, a manager that's an EA as well. You know, right now we're working through building out individual development plans or, you know, our OKRs or our goals or things like that. Um, and I can work with them really well because I know what's expected of them. Whereas a CEO or COO, they don't typically know <laughs> everything that we do. Um, but back to work-life balance, you know, it's it's here. I, you know, I'm signing on sometimes 7 a.m., 7.30, but then I'm taking off some time to get my son to school, coming mm -hmm. back online. Um, you know, we have happy hours a lot in the office in New York all the time. They're having happy hours and they have 
cold brew on tap and, you know, doggy <laughs> lounge and all the things. So it's definitely a different world. Um, but I haven't experienced it too much where it's like just working nonstop. But I know, you know, on the product side, there are times that are like that because you have to get a product launched by a certain time. Um so it's just, I think setting boundaries is so important. And that's something that I stress with my team too, of you have to put those boundaries down because if you don't have boundaries, you're just, people will be pinging you on Slack or text or whatever all mm-hmm. the time. Yeah. And, you know, I know people can't see you right now, although you can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash two one zero to see a screenshot of our conversation. But I noticed you have this cool little like it almost looks like a tree light behind you and then you've got a candle uh burning. So you know you've got your you've got your vibe going uh at, at home, which is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, so much of the time we're just sitting at our desk and um, at my last job or our last house, really, my office was in the basement. Now I have like windows and candles and I'm like, I just need all of the things so that Mm -hmm. I'm very zen and peaceful throughout the day. Love it. Yeah. Well, is there, uh, thanks again for being on the show, first of all, but just, just to wrap it up, what is the... What's one thing that you would like to tell assistants of the world and kind of leave them with um, at the end of this conversation? I think, you know, persevere, right? Just keep going. If you think you don't have the skills, um, it's probably imposter syndrome. Don't fall into that, you know, don't fall into I'm not good enough or I can't do it. If there's a job you want to apply to and you don't have all the skills, apply to it. You never know what's going to happen. You know, I always say that um, people hire the people they like the most, not necessarily the people with the best skill set, because you can train skills, you can't train personality. So, you know, be a good person, work hard, be with your family, do the things that you really love. And you'll get far in life and you don't have to have a degree to do it. I promise. (laughs) (laughs) You know, from experience, that's great. (laughs) Well, Lexi, uh, is LinkedIn the best place for people to reach out if they want to say hi? Yeah, I am super active on LinkedIn, have it up all day long. Um, So that is the best way to reach me. Great. Well, I'll put that link in the show notes, leaderassistant.com slash 210. And yeah, best of luck to you. Thanks again for jumping on and taking a risk and being courageous and saying, hey, I'll be on the show. Uh, Excited to have you. And uh, yeah, look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Jeremy. I loved it. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullows.com